My parents, nor most of my family members, never really understood what I did. My mom asked me, so they pay you to watch basketball games? I go, pretty much. The understanding of being a, a medical professional in the world of sport is a, it was for a long time, a weird thought process for her. I had almost same conversation with my grandmother when she was asking, what are you doing? And most of my job is, you know, it's on computer. I mean, managing people, doing some content. And I'm saying, I'm working on computer. And she's saying, okay, but how do you make money? <laughs> Erwin Valencia, the first ever Filipino to join a major U.S. sports franchise in an official capacity, Erwin has made waves as a high-performance expert, coach, and mentor. With a career spanning the NBA, NFL, and MLB, his insights into mindfulness, resilience, and holistic health have transformed lives. Holistic, being the holistic approach doesn't necessarily mean you're holistic because you do yoga with your player stuff. No, holistic is looking at each athlete as an individual. I've always questioned what life is and what I can do beyond what the books say. The natural curiosity of young learners is going away for a variety of reasons. It's weird and as simple as it is, travel. And I tried to tell my nephew, like, hey, you guys should spend time with the kids in the mountains and, and learn what it means to be an indigenous Filipino. And they're like, why? I'm an American. And you're like, oh God, here we go. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Erwin, it's an absolute pleasure having you today. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to uh, get rolling here and uh, talk about some fun stuff today. Yeah. You know, I wanted to start our conversation by acknowledging something that truly stands out about you. In every article I've read and video I've watched of you, there's a common thread that beautifully weaves through your story. And that's your deep connection to your Filipino heritage. Uh. So when I see how you've integrated your Filipino identity into your role, it's truly inspiring. For our viewers who don't know, Ern was, was the first ever Filipino to be part of any major U.S. sports franchise in an official capacity. So, Erwin, you've served as the team physical therapist and wellness lead for the New York Knicks. My first question to you is, can you share how your cultural background has shaped your journey in the NBA and why it's so important for you to keep it at the forefront of your work? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. And I think... It begins with uh, our Filipino culture of uh, of caring. Uh, I think you, you will uh, note that I think most Filipinos, we are hosts, we are caregivers, we are people that uh, want to make sure that experiences that people have with us are not only a delightful one, but unforgettable one in a good way. And so hence the reason why most Filipinos will end up finding themselves in the medical practitioners as medical practitioners, like physicians and nurses and 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 pharmacists, anyone, anything that's client facing, and I, I think for me, uh, the most fascinating thing is that when you know when you're younger, particularly in any Asian or immigrant community, you are already told what you're going to become. You can either be a, a right. lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, uh, you know, an engineer. You know, th these are what define you from the get go. And, and today's youth and society, because of how things have shaped up, uh, particularly of how you can get to the U.S., obviously the most common thread for most Filipinos now are either A, a caregiver, or B, a nurse. And they even made a joke about that, I think, during the the Emmys or the Gra uh, Emmys or the Oscars about like, you know, how is it possible that with all the with all the seasons of ER, there was not one mention <laughs> of a nurse that's Filipino when... <laughs> If you go to every hospital, at least 30 to 40 percent of nurses are Filipino. So uh, obviously that's not a direction I wanted to go. Uh, for me, it was about uh, finding a way to combine my passion and love for sport, but also being part of, of, of the show in a sense, but using, and using the skills I've had honed, but also grew up with as part of being Filipino, which is really being a caregiver to others. 
and a servant leader to others. And so in the years that I've spent in almost two decades in professional sport, you know, first with baseball and then with basketball, I think I've always led as somebody that was there to serve. It wasn't about me and and what advantages I could take when I was in the professional sport. It was more about more about how can I be of service to the athletes that I work with, how can I be of service to the coaches that that are my colleagues, how can I be of service to the other medical practitioners, especially during the most challenging times during our season when we're in a losing streak or when the middle of summer of baseball, when it's hot and you have to go to work uh, every single day and the grind is real where, where you know you're in the middle of you know, a hundred and sixty-two game season, and you're you're in game eighty-five, and you're like, well, you know, so to be there and saying, hey, uh, you know, I got you by even simply bringing people water and um, checking in on people has been something that's a trait that's inherently uh, in most Filipinos, and so I think being able to do that allowed me to really transcend most challenges that occur in professional sport because for me two things happened. One, I had that trait of caregiving already. And number two, that trait of resilience of seeing like saying like, hey, you know, life could be worse. So every time you go into it, there's a thought of positivity already. And I think, you know, and we'll talk about this a little later, how gratitude plays in my life. And hence the reason why my interest in the research and the science and the practice of gratitude in its full spectrum uh, because of the fact that I think Filipinos in general, we, we begin with a culture of gratitude, of gratefulness, because there's so many natural calamities that hit the country on a on a regular basis every year, twice a year, three times a year. There was just a flood last month. And, you know, most of the world, when a flood happens, people start complaining. People start saying, oh, life right. is done. People say like, oh, you know what? This is the worst thing that's happened in our lives. You see Filipinos, you know, jumping into the into the now river, which was the highway and having a go at it and having fun or or suddenly you see a floating couch with a bunch of people in it with drinking beers. You know, how do I make light of something that's challenging? So I think in a professional sports setting where the pressure is so high, being able to have this culture of gratitude that's within me as well as a culture to serve others has allowed me to really stay in the industry for a long time, but also be able to take care of myself because of it. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. When I was, you know, researching and learning more about your story, I, I was many parts of uh, your early on life. I, I I felt like I can really relate to that as well. I, I, my parents are from Bangladesh, uh, and although we're not known for being caretakers, um, you know, I had a lot of the same experiences of you know you have to be a doctor or an engineer, you know, nothing out of those you know two or three. For, well, or a lawyer out of those couple of fields, but also the typical immigrant journey and growing up as a child that, you know, feeling that natural gratitude, uh, I think it comes uh, more naturally to, uh, you know, to people who are born to hardworking immigrant families. It, it comes mm-hmm. a little bit more natural because you, you see your parents struggling, you understand what it means to have food on the table or a shelter over your head. Uh, but I, I do want to quickly ask you, uh, what did your parents think uh, or what, what you know your friends or surrounding uh, immediate important family members when you wanted to really venture out of those uh, important professions uh, uh, of you know being a, a doctor or uh, an engineer. I, I think for me, I found the middle ground. How can I find a way to still be in medicine because I come from right. a family of nurses and doctors, and so you know I was groomed to be a neurosurgeon. I was groomed to to, to take over a cardiac surgery practice, and I just mm-hmm. said no. I want to do something that's different. I want to be in a medical field, have a doctor beside my name, but at the same time, my parents nor most of my family members never really understood what I did. <laughs> so you know there there's 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 always a story that my mom that I always tell about my mom when there was a time that I I think first year in the NBA, my mom asked me, and I'm going to channel, channel my, my, my inner Joe Coy's mom version here when the, 
you know, my mom would ask me, honey, it's like, uh, I, I, I don't understand what you do. I go, well, what do you mean, mama? She goes, I watch you on TV. You're on TV every day, almost. But I see you in the, in the chair watching a game. <laughs> and I said, is that your job? I go, well, it's kind of part of my job. I like, I'm sitting there just in case a player gets injured. I'm one of the first ones to get out there. Uh, but I don't understand. Where's the hospital? I go, mom, there's, there's no hospital. There's, there's, I mean, we have an ambulance there for really bad injuries that goes to the hospital, but we pretty much have everything in the stadium. So what? You have all the equipment in the stadium? I go, yeah, we have x-rays that are necessary. We have a dentist. We have an orthopedic surgeon that does, that will sew things up. We have all the, all the fluids, all the medicines that we would ever need for that game itself. But I don't understand. I thought those things only belong to a hospital. Well, they they kind of do, but we have our own mini hospital within the arena because the player still has to go and play if he can play. But there's no hospital. I mean, <laughs> there is a hospital, mom. Like she she goes on and on in this situation, and then it's even funny because the, this is when I was in basketball. So they so my mom's like, so they pay you to watch basketball games? I go, <laughs> pretty much. And yeah. I was very, I was very well compensated at the same time too yeah. for to watch basketball <laughs> games, which most people would pay tickets at a very high rate for. And right. she goes, "I still don't understand. I don't. I cannot. It this. It, it cannot. I cannot understand this." And it was the same thing when I was in baseball because my mother would see me in the dugout. And I would be leaning over the dugout, and suddenly, in the middle of the game, my mom would. I, somebody would tell me, "Hey." I think that's your mom, dude, because I would hear footsteps running down, down towards like the dugout, and and, and then I would hear my mom. I would hear my mom going like, "An uh, anak," meaning 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 son or daughter. That's a, that's that or child. That's the Filipino mm -hmm. word for a child. Anak, anak, anak. I'm here, and then and then the ushers were like, "Ma'am, you can't go to the dugout. It's uh, you might get hurt." Goes, no, that's my son. That's my son. And then one of my players would just elbow me. It's like, dude, I think your mom is behind the dugout. And I'm like, what? And I would look back and she goes, ha, huh? Erwin, let's take a photo. Let's take a photo. I was like, mom, you can't right now. There's a game and there's a ball that's going to get hit that could hit your face. No, no, but I just want to take one photo of your mom. And I'm like, oh my God. This is like, she. I, I think she, my, my mother never really grew up in sport. And she yeah. never really played sports herself. So she didn't understand that there's risks involved and there's certain things that needs to be done in place when sport happens. So all of that gets thrown out the window. And so- from from my mother, the understanding of being a, a medical professional in the world of sport is a it was for a long time a weird thought process for her, mm -hmm. and so so even with my cousins and even my classmates, all they knew by the time, especially I got to the NBA, was that I was on the bench sitting next to the players, sitting next to the coaches, and the only questions people would ever ask me wasn't like how is it to be in the arena all that stuff. No, the question was like, do you go party with the players after the games? <laughs> That's <funny>. No, <laughs> no, we don't. That's just not, that is not part of what I do. Right. So, but this is, it was, it was always an interesting conversation in that sense, because there was, there's, it's, it's a, it's a weirdly unique niche mm -hmm. that I belong to. And unless you've ever been in sport or played at that level, you would understand the gravity for which I was very lucky to be part of for almost 20 mm. years. You know, it's so funny. I had almost same conversation with my grandmother when she was asking, what are you doing? And most of my job is, you know, it's on computer. I mean, managing people, doing some content here and there. And I'm saying, I'm working on computer. And she's saying, okay, but how do you make money? You know, all, all, they, all they want to, 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 to see is me going to the office, you know, do some something. I leave my house because everything <laughs> I do is from the house. <laughs> and they can wrap up in their minds. How can you make money just sitting and staring at your computer? <laughs> yeah, and and that's and that's unfortunately a generational situation. And I'm sure when we get older and when we have kids, I don't know if you guys have kids. Uh, there, as they grow up, they're going to do something quite unique. That unless we're at the forefront of innovation, we won't understand ourselves. And so I, I think, especially when it comes down to that next, like your grandmother, you know, is is a bit far removed than your parents. Your parents may be like, oh yeah, he, I kind of understand how he could make money. I don't really fully understand. I kind of understand. But your grandmother, now that's like, they were the period of time that they had to like use their hands in order to make, to make right. money. So 
Yeah, I use my hands to tap on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Erwin, uh, your work with uh, elite athletes and sport teams has given you, of course, a unique perspective on physical therapy and performance. So I'm curious about the bigger picture here. Uh, could you please share your thoughts on this? How can interdisciplinary approach of connecting physical therapy, sports science, and mindfulness and holistic health enhance our understanding of complex uh, problems in fields like injury prevention and performance optimization? Yeah, I mean, all of that is, uh, I think, as the research and the evidence is, is starting to show up even more and more, particularly in the science of sport, uh, as well as the evidence that's really showing up in the uh, wellness side of things, as well as the biohacking space, it's being able to give people a better understanding of what is right and what is wrong. And, you know, it's up to them to look at the evidence and see whether or not they believe the evidence and if it's something that they works for them. So it's really the combination of what works in real life, but also what authors have done in a clinical study. For me, my approach has always been, you know, um, number one, experiential, and number two, um, number two, how has the evidence has that has been out there proven itself? So even though there are studies that we use for all the stuff that we've done, we still have the question in because each un player is unique. Each player is an individual. So every athlete you work with, um, you can't say that they're part of that clinical study. They were the exact, you know, they were exact, um, I, I guess, candidate for that study because most of the studies that are out there are, are placed upon... Um, place upon athletes that have a certain qualification. And the challenge working in professional sport is that most athletes are outliers of any of these qualifications. And so for me, I've always looked at the approach of like, what does the individual want and need? And particularly looking beyond uh, the physical, looking beyond what you see in front of you, and then asking questions allows you to really see the bigger picture. I think being part of the personal growth world and um you know, they both know that i'm very active in the community the mind valley community which i've been part of for more than 10 years for 11 years now as well as my own personal growth journey which began with the silva method when i was like 13 or 14 years old uh, and and as well as meditation and martial arts which began when i was seven i've always questioned what life is and what i can do beyond what the books say in order for me to feel better about what I do, how I play my sport, and then how I relate to other athletes as well. So holistic, being the holistic approach doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're just, oh, now you're holistic because you do yoga with your players. No, no. holistic is looking at each athlete as an individual and tailor making their programs for each one of them according to their mind, body, and spirit. And when you was working in, uh, in NBA, do, did you practice uh, meditation with the players? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I then one of my claim to fame in the in the NBA was the fact that I was one of the first to bring uh, a, an an in season daily breath work, mindfulness, and meditation program to the league. I was one of the first uh, to bring the app called Headspace, which which in itself was one of the first meditation apps available in the technological space to professional sport, and was used as a beta program for Headspace before they launched it. Uh, in the bigger picture to the Olympic Games. And this was because of my relationship with Andy Puttacombe, who was the founder of Headspace, who was a monk for 10 years, as well as Rich Pearson, who was his business partner uh, when they launched Headspace. And they and I, and I pushed their envelope to see how we can make sport as part of their program. And then eventually then really because of the guidance and mentorship and the allowance of the then president and my idol, Phil Jackson, uh, really allowed me to really push the boundaries of bringing this concept of mindfulness, which he did back in the 90s with Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, along with, you know, his, his you know, one of one of his colleagues, George Mumford, uh, to make it part of an everyday situation. Back in the day, it was, it was pretty selective. Plus, Phil was also a head coach rather than a team president. So it was really different when you're a head coach or you're there every day compared to being a team president, which you're really above. So I was, in a sense, the ground level person that rolled my sleeves and allowed this concepts of what we would consider wellness directly to the players. But I think the beauty of that is the fact that I, I embodied it. And I think in order for players to trust you of what you're trying to teach, you yourself have to be that person 
or else they'll just think it's all it's all smoke. Did you see resistance from the player? Resistance from doing the meditation? Yeah, of course. I, I mean, it be, resistance will always be something that's part of any athlete that's pushed the boundary and gone to the highest level possible of their sport. Because why? They if they've done it without that, right. then why would they need it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think so. You have to number one embody that fully, and number two show them in certain cases and circumstances why it works. And so during days that everyone feels sad, then the question that they ask you is, why are you constantly happy? Why do you feel like you're you are always grounded? You said, because I have a practice that I do every day that I've been doing for 40 years since I was a kid. And this practice has allowed me to know that I'm never too high, I'm never too low, and I'm always ready for a battle, whatever that battle looks like. And they're like, oh, cool, can you teach me some of that? So it's about that trust that occurs because you embody it. I think the challenge with so many people out there who are meditation practitioners that are even sports psychologists and mental coaches is that they assume that that certain athletes need something, but they themselves don't do it. So now they're trying to broadcast or teach these athletes what they're supposed to do, but oftentimes well, they don't practice. They're not doing it. They don't embody. They don't. They don't feel, look, and present it. Uh, let, let's say a rah rah sports psychologist. I have a lot of sports psychology friends, but most of them are like rah rah. Let's go. Let's motivate. Let's move it. But then if that person doesn't like that, just like oh, that's too much, then they won't resonate with that. So right. uh, you know, they, they, or suddenly if that rah rah person, especially if you're like a strength coach and you're like oh, I'm like you, I'm like I'm about lifting 300 kilos all the time and blah blah blah. And suddenly one day you're gonna be like I'm actually a meditation teacher, blah blah blah. And they're like. I don't believe you. <laughs> this is not real. So, so the key really is to practice what you preach. Yeah. And when you practice what you preach, players will trust you, especially in the most challenging of times in their own lives and their careers. And then after that, it's you can spread the word like butter. Mm. You know, I, since we're talking about this, I I, I want to ask: given your experience, I, you, obviously you've dealt with so many high-level athletes, but also you're you know you 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 you've been with Mind Valley for over ten years now, and you've met incredible people that are super talented. I kind of want to broaden my, my question here: is what insights have you gained about human potential that 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 our viewers might like? Like, I don't think many of us realize just how incredible are the human potential is but you've seen some of the highest caliber people so so to the regular to the regular person what are some of the greatest human potential that we can achieve not as as athletes but you know just regular or you know just let's just say we're an average person number one we we can we can change our we can change our bodies as well as change our minds it begins with changing our mind, which then changes our bodies. I think me, myself, as somebody who's been an athlete for most of my life, being healthy most of my life, never had to have medication, never had to have, uh, I've never went, I've never stayed at a hospital for myself until last year when I hurt my back, mm. you know, which then changed my life, which then shifted what the direction of my life and career is currently today. And literally for more than four decades, I never touched a hospital unless I was working on it. So I, I always thought I was infallible. But as I was getting older and then you start getting these tests for like, you know, your your blood pressure and your cholesterol. And and there was one time I felt sluggish and there was one time like, ooh, I think my weight is slowly getting more than I'm used to. And, you know, my body's getting sluggish. And is it because I'm, I'm stressed out because of work? You know, I'm getting a little anxious because of the fact that now as... Uh, I was I was at one point the head of medicine and performance for for the Knicks as their director of training and conditioning, and so the pressure of Madison Square Garden as well as the NBA and everything else now was seeping upon me. So, you know, I, I saw a physician on my annual checkup. He says, "Hey, your 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 blood pressure is pretty high. We need to like switch you up and take you take some meds." And I was like, "I could either a yeah sure continue my lifestyle, take some meds, or b do something about it." And it was. Thanks to one of the Mind Valley authors, Eric Edmeets, who has this anthropological approach to uh, eating and lifestyle, um, with regards to not necessarily diet, diet, but just like your everyday way to eat differently, uh, allowed me to really bring my blood pressure down and created a, a new way for me to eat, where 
yes, I, I you know, I, I've kind of gone away from it a little bit more nowadays compared to when I first did it. But like the work is done in that first year or two of you changing the way you look at food and you view food. And it's because of that. And when I first tried it out, I lost, I lost 20 pounds. Wow. And it turns out the 20 pounds was a lot of it was just me, uh, bad eating habits where I never questioned anything. Like if you do it mindfully, if you eat mindfully, you won't just, you won't just feel better because of the fact that you're eating something better every day, but also you feel better because the choice that you make to eat what you eat reflects on how you then move through your day. It's like, if I know I'm going to eat a dirty burger and feel sluggish today, day, at least I know. Right. But it's this mindless eating of something that you're not sure about just because you want to do it and never question it that then makes it a bad habit. But if you're mindful of that thought process and knowing what's good and what's bad and maybe trying to play for the tie or maybe trying to make sure that you have more of the good stuff from to bad, then you can allow yourself cheat days. And I think that switched my mind up, which then allowed me then to not only lose 20 pounds, but feel probably in the, one of the best shapes of my life, particularly when pandemic hit, it was the peak of me practicing everything I learned from the different things that I've learned, not only from professional sport and the nutritionists that surround myself with and the strength coaches that surround myself with, but also all my mind, my, you know, all the things I've learned, personal growth and development through Mind Valley. Did you lower your blood pressure mostly by dropping the weight or were there other things? I lower my breast pressure by eating right. Can you exp uh, expand on that? And I, I, again, I want to tie it back into community because community is important to you. Community is important to me. So I, as I, my parents from Bangladesh. So in our Desi community, maybe even know this, we are notorious think... for everybody having diabetes and high blood pressure. And so if I can even get through to one person for, I don't know, a day, I, I, it might be a win in my book. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, I see, you know, everywhere in my community, uh, high blood pressure is the standard. And it's, it's you you hit it exactly. It's the relationship with food. So I just wanted to see if you can delve a little bit more because I want to send this to all of my community members specifically. <laughs> Say, hey. I mean, it, it, it's the same in the, it's the same in the Philippines. High blood pressure is part mm -hmm. of who we are as a culture because of the amount of pork we eat on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. diabetes is such a part of our culture because of the amount of sweets we love. And, mm, okay. and, and as much as, and so the, the, so the answer there is, 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 uh, you know, meat that's not that's that's not good. Fat is important, but a different kind of fat isn't. There's certain fats that are good, but there's a lot of fat that's not good. But then there's also sugar, which you just remove remove most of the time, and that changes everything. And for me, the biggest shift for me was was sugar. Finally enough, mm. like you know, I I stopped having sugar with my coffee. I stopped, you know, I stopped um, I stopped just eating desserts just to eat dessert. If I wanted dessert because I wanted to try it, I would try it, but I wouldn't eat the whole cake. Right. You okay. know, I I would make I would make dessert or something with sugar as a reward rather than a privilege. Mm. Number one. Number two, when it came to meats, I would I would be more I would be more choosy with regards to choosing lean meats over fatty meats. You know? And how often would I eat meat, if ever. So I I, I don't think I turn and I don't think I ever will be vegan or vegetarian, I was uh, at one point in time for probably four years, I did every Monday would be my, my vegan Mondays. And I meet that called mm -hmm. meatless Mondays. And I went vegan every Monday for probably four years. And I think that's what kept me on track mm -hmm. um, and allowed me to really like have this great habit. But it's it, like I said, it, like, like I said, and that like you were asking to, it's about the relationship with food, making this choice is knowing that if you ingest something and you eat something, how is it going to affect you? And if you realize the next day that it doesn't make you feel good, then why continue to do that? Right. But it's a lot of time it's the mindless eating that doesn't make us healthy. And then now you're you're in this downward spiral. Now it's becoming high blood pressure. Now it's becoming diabetes. Now you're leading yourself to other situations, which now you won't have the control of because now your body is failing you and you don't exercise. And I think that's a, that's a lot of things. Is then it's it's not even about everyone thinks the exercise. Oh man, I need to go to the gym and make sure that I'm going on the treadmill and and blah, blah, blah. When in fact, it, most of the literature now is showing that just by simply taking a 20 minute walk every single day can change your life. Mm, yeah, we've heard that plenty of several times. Yeah. I like that you said about the habit. You see, a lot of people, they starting doing dieting or going to gym, you know, they pushing themselves for a week, then they got lazy, then they skip, then another day they skip and everything got, comes back. So here, I think, I mean, my advice at least would be just 
try to push yourself for 100 days. And then after 100 days, you will get your habit going. And then you will feel not going to the gym, you know, you will feel that something is wrong. Some, my, my day went, you know, to the other direction instead of just going to the gym and doing to the diet. And then it's just going to be the habit and it's going to be very easy to follow. Yeah, you actually don't even need, you don't even know how to days. I mean, in reality, if you're really smart about it, you're going to get it in three weeks, three weeks to a month. You're already feeling it, but, but you're right. It's once you get to that three-week mark, it's it's the moment you feel like, oh man, I, I I need to do this, and then you miss out. But then you don't act upon it. You'd be like, oh, I'll do it again next week. And that's when you start falling. It's it's that moment when you feel like, oh, I need to do it. Then you need to do it. Like so, for me, when I went to Estonia for a month, I was in Barcelona for a month prior to going to Mind Valley University for a month, and I worked out pretty much three four times a week, and that get me set up. So by the time I got to Estonia, I was in a good shape, and I when I first arrived there. I paid for I paid for a gym membership right away, and then unfortunately, when I got to Estonia, there were so many rules about going to the gym. You have to wear different shoes. You mm. can't wear your socks. You can't wear no your feet. People are going to look at you. The certain times are open. The air conditioners work. They don't really use aircon. And it's like there's so many things, and and you can either a make them an excuse or b like okay, I'm still trying to get to get in here. And if I don't go to the gym, then maybe I swim in the sea, you know, mm. or or, right. or or b instead of. Uh, taking a taxi to go to the to the hub of education, then I'm going to make sure that I walk there every day. Right. And and in in and Tallinn is beautiful because you you can literally walk the entire city every single day, and you're mm. getting all your steps in. And so I think knowing that you live an active lifestyle doesn't necessarily mean that you be in the gym every day, and then you punish yourself when you don't. Vlad, before you ask your next question, I have a very important question for you, Erwin. And that qu- I know we're getting very sidetracked with my question, but I, I know you, <laughs> you 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 posted something about uh, Vikings Valhalla that you you, you watched. Oh the, yeah, the I love it. Hold on, though. Here's my qu- here's the very important question. The question is: Have you watched The Last Kingdom? Oh yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. Do Do you like? Okay, that's that's my favorite show. I mean, as, as soon as I saw yeah. that, I started to rewatch it. Actually, that's I remembered a, about a, The Last Kingdom. Yeah, Last Kingdom. That's a uh, um, what's the name? Uh, Brabenberg, Brabenberg, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Bra- oh, what's his name? I, um, I, I even forget his name. What's his name, uh, Vlad? Uh, Bra- Bra- um, Bebenberg. But... Something Bebenberg. Some, so, something of Bebenberg. What's his name? I don't remember. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's be- one of my... F- something of Bebenberg. Something. Oh, man, you're going to kill me let's, now. I'm let's gonna look get... it up. Let's look it up. But what, this Viking of Valhalla, there is a new season? Yeah, there's a new season. I have not watched it, though. But there's a new season that came out. You really Utrecht. don't? Dude, Utrecht. I already watched the whole... Utrecht of Bebenberg. Utrecht of there you Bebenberg. go. Yeah, Utrecht. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I, I watched season one. So I'm, I, I have not caught up to the, the new season that, that was released. Uh, but it just reminded me. So yeah, I, I'll be watching that. Vlad, you need to go watch it also. Yeah, I will watch it. Actually, I was watching it. I didn't know the new one came out. Yeah. And you know, actually, after after we watched The Lost Kingdom with my wife, she said, go do the same hair. Oh, <laughs> oh the, uh, the, what, the... With the, 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 with the hair growing out? Short side. And yeah, uh, with the hair growing, growing like this. <laughs> That'll be cool. <laughs> That'll be cool. You should do it. Uh, may, may, maybe. It's going to take me maybe a Yeah, year, it's but... going to take a okay. little bit for you to be able to do that. Yeah, Utrecht of Bebenberg. Utrecht of Yeah, but Last Kingdom is epic. Yeah, Last Kingdom. Uh, Last Kingdom. Uh, but but yeah, the Vikings of Valhalla, Vikings the new season, is, this is pretty cool too. It's like I, I could not stop. Like I, uh, you know, I was I was in Estonia. And so <laughs> you imagine I would walk around and I felt like I felt the whole vibes of the whole situation where yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go do archery in the in in the side there because there's you can do archery in, in near the castle. I'm gonna walk around old town and wear my like cloak and walk, and everyone would be like, "Damn, like, how how are you wearing jeans and this like medieval cloak?" You know, because I was just feeling the vibes. I love Vikings. Yeah, I apologize for getting us way off track, uh, but it's fine. Let, let me put us back. <laughs> So I want to speak about the um, the nowadays. So because of the rapid technology advancements, and especially in healthcare and fitness, we see a lot of advancements in uh, in the spheres. So with that in mind, in a world where technology is becoming increasingly prevalent in healthcare and fitness, what discipline you believe will be the most important for people, especially young athletes, to focus on in the next ten years? Oh, uh, mental performance. 
I think we we are going so far into the robotics, artificial intelligence, sports science side of things that today's world is losing the humanity. But if you've watched the Olympics, it's showing how important humanity is. I mean, you'll see Simone Biles taking a moment and saying like, you got this, you got this, you got to see. I, I was witnessing this Australian high jumper where she would, what you call anchor, a very silver method thing. She would anchor before she would run. She would, before her high jump, she would anchor, think about it, close her eyes, anchor, anchor. She would shake her shoulders a little bit and then she would go and make a jump. And then there's another, another high jumper. Then after finishing, she went, she would, before she jumped, she would cheer. She was like, let, let's go. And then she would clap, let's go. And then after she finished her jump, she will come back and journal right away. And I was like, okay, we love to see the fact no matter how much science has pushed things to, for us to be able to do things to the limit, the human side of, of athletes is what makes what makes athletics fun, what makes sport really worth doing, where passion and purpose lies. Because if it's just robots that are going up there trying to do what they need to do, then just put robots in. You know, I, I mean seeing Mondo right after he not only beat, you know, beat his own world record, you know, and won the gold medal for, for, for the pole vault, the first thing he did was run to his girlfriend and kiss her. And that's what makes people <laughs> endearing to him. Yeah. It's not, not the fact that, oh, I, I completed this and thanks to my sports scientists and my strength coaches that now you just no, thank my family, girlfriend. Uh, and I think in the end, you have that community as you're talking about Anaya and the support that you have that allows you to find success that goes beyond any kind of technology that's necessary in order to find success and be able to become the best at what you do. And how many people you think, not people, how many athletes you think really practicing it right now, uh, percentage wise? Well, I think 30%. If that, if you're lucky, if, if you're lucky, the elite, the elite, we mean 5%, but 30%, I think is saying that because there's, I think there's a handful of people who are seeing this and the kids are now recognizing how important it is to make sure that they, they have conversations with people that they trust in order for them to push forward. What age do you think we should start practicing it? As early as possible. I started meditation when I was seven. Parents introduced it to you? My, my Taekwondo teacher. Hmm. Okay. That makes sense. But that said, but that said, my father had a library of books that I, I loved that I was always curious about when I had Shaolin monks and had uh, the Bushido code of the the samurai, uh, the Hashashins, the ninjas, all these things I was always fascinated by. Plus also when I was like four years old, my grandmother had all these books of, of something called the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, which were mystery books that allowed me to be more curious about the world alongside Encyclopedia Britannica, and which I know kids nowadays don't even know what Encyclopedia Britannica was, but it allowed my mind to really look that there's something beyond what we have here it made me right. question the, the place that I was in because why, how is it possible that there's these massive stone stones that have heads that are in the middle of the ocean that nobody knows how they got there? And it took me, it took me a while to get there. I, I got there in my thirties. I finally got to Rapa Nui in my thirties, uh, where at one time was, it was the, it was the most remote inhabited island in the planet. And by the time I think I got, I got to Easter Island when I was 30, Two, 33 and it was the greatest travel experience of my life because I've been dreaming of going there since I was four. I'm listening to your story and I'm thinking of something that's really important to me which is uh, so you know like we're really immersed in the education field and one of the things that always keeps me up at night is how do we drive curiosity to young minds because I think we've lost that and you mentioned that you know you would read you know, stories as a, as a child. And I remember reading many different titles that, you know, you just open up your brain and explore and think about the endless possibilities. But that, that central theme of curiosity, maybe I'm wrong because I'm not a subject matter expert and, and I don't have the data in front of me, but I, I think, and I'm pretty, I, I think I'm right in saying this, that the, the natural curiosity of young learners is going away uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Any suggestions on how we can spark curiosity in young minds? Take off social media and phones from their hands. Well, if that was, <laughs> it's it's a great idea. It's just not gonna going to happen. That's the thing. <laughs> it's just gonna get it's just gonna get heavier and heavier. Like the influence of social media to young minds is gonna be heavier. For me, I mean, it's it's a, it's weird and as simple as it is, travel. 
travel. And if you can't travel, mm. exchange programs. Have people come to your place uh, or you come to them as an exchange student. I think one of the greatest gifts that my parents and my father particularly gave me was the opportunity to live with other families at a young age. You know, mm. I, you know, I, besides when I was eight years old, I was on a plane by myself wow. to get to the US to live with my godfather uh, because of everything that was happening in the Philippines. And then I came back to the Philippines at the age of 10. And by the age of 12, I was in Japan for one semester living with a host family in the city called Toyota, where Toyota factory was living with a family that were, who were workers for Toyota. And uh, you know, I had to learn Japanese. They had to learn English. We, we had to, I had to find a common means for us to understand each other and lived in the present moment because of that. And then, and then at the age of 14, I was in Indonesia or 13 or 14 in Indonesia. And I lived with a host family there too. And, and seeing a completely different view of like, oh, wow, Indonesia now, it's my first understanding of Muslim culture coming from a Christian nation like the Philippines that happened mm. to be right next door to us. But then realizing that that all these things that uh, of the Muslim culture that was happening in the south of the Philippines, which is really a lot of insurgents, a lot of kidnappings, a lot of war, a lot of like violence that did not happen when I lived with a family in Indonesia, you know, mm. and then appreciating learning how to eat things like nasi goreng and drink tea and appreciate tea with sugar, you know, which of course wasn't the best thing, but at least it made me appreciate tea because I hated tea because it was bitter. But but making me taste tea with sugar would make me realize tea can actually taste good. And then you just make a decision to wean off it on your own. But your taste buds realize like you actually can eat it. I went to a Jap, I uh, went to, I climbed Mount Fuji when I was, you know, like 13 with an international camp of people. And we were a bunch of kids from Southeast Asia. And I learned how to catch fish with my hands and, and eat a tomato. And I hated tomatoes, but I had to learn it because I tasted what a good tomato tastes like. And I was like, wow, tomatoes are actually good. And you can actually eat them straight without having them to be cooked. And so for me, if you bring kids into outside of their comfort zone at an early age and let them stay with families where they have no control of what they can dictate, then they have to learn how to work in the position that they're in. And I, I say that because um, even even in my own with my own nephews, where, you know, we bring them to the Philippines and they don't even like to go and hang out with kids in the Philippines because they're like, oh well, you know, we're you know, I don't know what to talk to them about. I go, what do you mean? Like <laughs> it's like what do you mean like to, like it's one thing to to go with your cousins, but now to throw them in a situation where now they're maybe like spending time, you know, one of my you know, I have two nonprofits and one of my foundations um, helps with the mental health uh, of kids um, in the mountain areas of the Philippines with tribes, with the local indigenous tribes, but also in the island communities. And I tried to tell my nephew, like, hey, you guys should spend time with the kids in the mountains and, and learn what it means to be an indigenous Filipino. And they're like, why? <laughs> why do we need to do that? I'm like, what do you mean why? Yeah. So, be, because of the fact you learn what it's like to be an indigenous Filipino, it's like, well, I'm, I'm an American, and you're like, oh God, here we go. <laughs> you know, you know, I see, I see sense in it, and I agree with you, but it feels so hard. My daughter will turn eight next year, and I hardly imagine myself sending her to other country to live with some other family. Oh my God, it will be torture for me. <laughs> I know. I mean, but, but I see sense, but. For, for me, myself, I imagine myself at, let's say, eight or nine years old to go somewhere else and feel nice, you know, adapt. But to send my own kids, this is really tough. Yeah. And and, and, and I, I am mindful about the fact and full transparency, I don't have kids that I know of. Um, so I can't really <laughs> say that I understand how you feel, but I see it in the lens of my nephews. And, and mm. yes, I understand the world is very different nowadays. So you don't have to go any, I think the thing is, then if, if going across the seas is too far or challenging or difficult, then go to the next state, you, right. you know, go, just go, go, with go to, yeah, or go to a country that's next door, you know, literally like, or, 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 or be part of it. And I think it's funny because old world thought process would say like, Hey, why would you, you need stability. So you can't bring a kid to a different part of the planet and live in Costa Rica for a year. But I have friends who have done it and the kids that have been part of that are utterly amazing. And I say that because I, I was teaching kids in Mind Valley University who are for both kids, teens, and 
uh, the, the, the youth program, which is six to 12, and then the teens program, which is 13 to 18. And each of these kids that were at Mind Valley University during their program, I would ask them where they're from and says, oh, my, my dad is German, my mom is Russian, but we live in Dubai. I speak mm-hmm. three languages, you yeah. know? So uh, I, I, you know, my, my, my dad is, my dad is, um, my dad is Costa Rican and my mom is uh, Brazilian and we live in Miami, you know, and, 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 the, and the mixture of cultures is allowing kids to have their own, almost like they're all third culture kids. And I was a third culture kid too, growing up, but not to that extent where you have multiple cultures really like mixing in like this. And, you know, I was a third culture kid because I, I was a Filipino that lived in America and American that lived in the Philippines. And, and, and then oh, as a Filipino lived in Japan growing, it was this because of the culture, but by blood, oh, there's a lot of kids that by blood are now third culture kids that then don't live in any of their parents' countries. And for yeah. me, that's so fascinating because so instead of traveling to that place, now the, the, the traveling's within their blood. And so the only, so the one way to make that even to enhance that is to let their kids go to the countries where they were from, where their parents were from, hang out with grandma and grandpa and allow them to learn what it's like to be that country. Because in that, in that short span and like fully there, you know, fully be there and, you know, and not, you know, for like a summer, for a month and, and be able to like meet kids that don't speak your language. Now you, you, now the kids are not forced to learn the language because now like even my nephews don't know how to speak Filipino. And it, for me, it's kind of right. sad, you know? So I like the idea of going and living in one country for a year or two, then going another country, live for a couple of years. But I see a lot of parents right now screaming at us probably. <laughs> but kids should be staying in one place. What about friends? They'll make friends. They'll, then, you know, if they're going to be traveling, there are going to be no friends to hang out, la, 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 you know, all this kind of well, stuff. Well, to add to that, we can, uh, you all have the other side of the spectrum saying, this is privileged talk. Uh, inflation is rampant. It's soaring. Uh, I'm trying to barely afford rent and cover my, you know, put a roof over our heads. So there's a, a lot of things in play. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree that it is one of the greatest gifts that you can receive is being ex- exposed and immersed in different cultures. And I hope to do that with, with my child as well. Um, but I want to kind of segue into this topic. I want to talk uh-huh. about gratitude. And I know... Uh, gratitude is central here and you know we we, we haven't touched uh, so i want to touch more directly on it let me ask you very bluntly why should we why, why gratitude why should we have gratitude does it really help people well i'll i'll answer that with a scientific answer um gratitude is the only emotion or variable that the human body feels that has no negative polarity so mm-hmm. by saying that people can be happy but still be sad People can be joyous, but still have anger. But when you're in the complete state of gratitude, you can't be ungrateful at the same time. Hmm. So if you practice gratitude and make it a central part of your life, it it literally is the only thing that you're feeling and seeing and embodying. You can have love, but love is different because love can be a painful love. Love can be an additional right. love. You could feel love and have a good emotion, but then you could feel love and be sad and angry. But when you're grateful, you can't be anything else. Being grateful is being grateful. And your body, your mind, your soul can say like, at this moment in time, I'm feeling grateful. And if you're feeling grateful for something really real and not what these these kids in Gen Alpha and Gen Z nowadays, like, hey, I'm grateful because now I have a new car or I'm grateful <laughs> because, you know, hashtag gratitude because, right. you know, my mom bought me some makeup. Like, heck no. There's a reason why that's why, that's why when you say something that you're grateful for something, answer the question, why? And have somebody hold you accountable for that, because when you hold, when you when you're held accountable for your gratitude, and then you you answer the question why, then it becomes a real situation. Then people ask you about that, and now you can answer their 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 why of you, because it's real. It's not one ear the other ear. So, so using that as a, as a force, then it becomes then you when you and when you say that it's like then gratitude is a superpower. Once you really practice it, and like any muscle, it takes like any habit, it's something you need practice in. You know, you have to be number one, you yourself have to embody it. Number two, you have to be surrounded by people that believe that gratitude works too. 
Hence the reason why a culture like the Philippines, where no matter how crazy the natural calamities are happening, people have a smile on their faces. No matter if, if, if a, a mom who has to leave their kids back in the Philippines to work as a nanny for mm. a family in Dubai, yes, there's days that she's sad, but her smile on her face is because of the fact that she's grateful she has an opportunity to now make her kids' lives better. And I think it's that mindset that is necessary of, of a grateful mindset that allows you then to live through life, knowing that you have hope, that happiness is next door, even in the most darkest of times, or yeah. the fact that when you live in this present moment, you just make the most out of it because what else can you do? Yeah. So I, I think, I think that's why gratitude is so important and why that's why it's, for me, it's something I've been studying for, you know, for the past six, seven years and why I'm pursuing to finish a PhD on it. So I'm two years removed from finishing my PhD wow. to prove how gratitude is a superpower and a tool that can be used in the world of high performance. How do you practice gratitude besides meditation? No, multiple ways. I don't even, meditation isn't even at the peak of this. So um, once again, from a scientific standpoint, there, there's number one, there's, there's different things. So first, if it goes through my day, I start my day by the most simple thing that I teach a lot of the athletes I've never experienced gratitude or even mindfulness or even for that moment is to really simply put your hand and your right hand and your heart, your left hand over the right hand. And even with your eyes closed, as you first wake up in the morning, before you move your feet, before you open your eyes, you take a nice deep breath. And when you breathe in, say thank you for the fact that you can breathe. And then you can breathe one more day. For simply saying that, you begin your cycle already. You begin with a thought process of gratitude because it's always mm. said in psychology that your first thought is what pretty much makes what your day is going to be like. If you really think about crap and you wake up in the morning, you say crap, yeah. you'll have a crappy day. Right. You, you speak true. into existence what you want. So you say when you're grateful, you start with your day because I'm breathing. Now, everything I do from now on is just, you know, this is just the icing and the cake. Everything I do is, is I can I can complete it now. And then I go into that. Then I turn and I write into my gratitude journal. What are the three things that I'm currently grateful for in this moment in time that I can push on for my day? And those are, that's what you call the three. That's what you call three things. Uh, that that's been that has evidence behind it as well in the world of positive psychology. And then after that, I go in, you know, go to the bathroom and I come out. And then I do my meditation. And then what I do is I picture a person specifically. That allows me to be grateful. I see this person in front of me, give a smile on my face. And if I feel like that this is a person that I need to call, write a letter to, or just contact con with, call with, then then within that day or within that week, I'm contacting that person. Because at me, it's a sign from I would say a sign from God, from the universe to say that there's a message that this person has for you. And that thought process is a smaller version of what is called the gratitude visit or the gratitude letter, which is the uh, the technique, the highest rated technique in positive psychology that has evidence to back it up, that has the highest degree of change when it relates to your all, your all overall well-being. And if we talk about well-being, well-being is ultimately how we feel, which is a combination of happiness, a combination of life fulfillment, all of things, which are what you call the PERMA score which has, once again, also evidence to support what that means. And so if we find ourselves in this situation, if we're looking at that and how we're feeling, how happy we are, then we got to make sure we start with, you know, being grateful. And if we feel like we really want to push the envelope a little bit more, then once a month, write a letter to somebody who maybe you have a falling out with. Write a letter to somebody maybe you had a fight with or maybe you haven't seen in a long time. Write that letter with a hand and a piece of paper, not an email or a text and then make an appointment to meet them. And when you meet them, read them that letter, be be uncomfortable with reading that letter and allow that person to receive it fully. And then when that happens, your body, your mind and soul now finds itself at a level where relief sets in, but also this level of feeling good now stays. And it stays for you for three to four weeks. So imagine if you write a gratitude letter and present it to somebody once a month for 12 months in a year, then you're always living at your highest well-being potential. Have you ever skipped your routine? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect by any means. And maybe sometimes I, I miss writing on my journal because let's say, for example, I'm in a different country or I'm traveling three time zones 
and it's hard for me to be like, oh, which time zone should I write this in because I I missed it already, you know. So, and but the key is like when you create these rituals, is make them as as a minimal viable product as possible. I think the challenge with some people is like they try to put so much on their plate that if they don't fulfill it, just like we're talking about a habit of exercise and working out, then you don't end up doing it. Then now you give up completely. Make it easy for yourself. And if it's something that doesn't work for you, then make it even easier. Erwin, we have a tradition on the podcast where we each, uh, where we ask each pre, uh, each guest any question they would like to ask our next guest. And so this is a question from our last uh, guest that we had on, and we'll ask it. But after that question, we're going to ask you to give us a question. It could be anything. It can be bizarre. It can be professional. Whatever you'd like. But I will say this question is uh, it's 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 a, it's not a bad question at all. So the question from our previous guest uh, is, what was the lowest point in your journey, and when was it that you knew you were going to make it? Hmm. Great question. Uh, the lowest point in my journey. Um... I'd have to say it's funny, and I can pinpoint the, the year, 2013. 2013 was the most challenging year of my life, but also was the greatest year of my life. 2013, I was going through a challenging, challenging relationship with a really, um, with, a, with a very manipulative partner that I felt like I couldn't get out of. Like, imagine how somebody just, you know, you're already like feeling bad you know, as, you know, as you've broken up, but then continue to just hammer you. Um, and for me, it was so challenging because then I still had to, at that period of time, I, I had, you know, I just left, left the pirates, uh, baseball. So I left baseball after eight years, I was mentoring a nephew of mine who wanted to get in the profession. And then at the same time, I was going through a really bad breakup. So I had no job. I my relationship was very bad, and I was trying to get over it. And I still had to mentor my nephew to tell him like life was going to be good. You're going to be a you're going to be in right. my shoes too in the future. <laughs> and he's like he's like he he my and my and he was the one that was like like my shoulder to cry on. He was like twenty. He was like nineteen or twenty. You know, his parents bought him yeah. a ticket to meet me in Vegas, and he was staying in like the hotel I was staying in Vegas. As we were having a conference, and he, I was trying to introduce him to the people that maybe will be his mentors in the future. While I was mentoring him, meanwhile, deep inside, I was going through some really bad situations because I was getting anxiety and depression. My, my you know, my my ex at that time was just hounding me continuously. It's just like you're you're never. You know, you can't break up with me. You know, nobody breaks up with me. You're, mm. you know, and so it was such a low point in my life that I was like, I, how can I ever get out of this? It's like impossible. What I did is I, I took, I took a risk on putting my finances and whatever I had left into community, and to community that I wanted to be part of. Number one, the first place that I went to uh, was something called Leaders Perf Leaders in Performance, which is like one of these big communities. Uh, for people in the world of sport and high performance where people there are like the you know the the chairman of the nba the um you know the the head sports scientists of arsenal the you know the, the anything that's that's like high level the managers and above managers directors vice mm -hmm. president press of teams around the world and not just not just from a from a medicine and performance standpoint but from like a management standpoint and from a marketing standpoint so Everyone in sport was there and, you know, I was representing, you know, New Zealand as the head of medicine and performance, as the director of medicine and performance for New Zealand, or for baseball in New Zealand, which was, you know, wasn't really even in the map because like there's baseball in New Zealand, but mm. I was, but I was, I was in the conversation, I was in the table and that kind of got me bad. It's like, oh, you know what? I, I'm, I'm worth something, you know, like I'm here with all these people the head of Red Bull high performance that that made that guy go to outer space and jump from a balloon, you know, uh, Daniel Epstein that talk about how technology has changed, which has made athletes faster. You know, there's, it was like, wow, this is crazy. I, I belong here. This is where I belong. And then I went to Burning Man afterwards and I went to Burning Man and that, that made me like, wow, I, I belong to a community that's like pushing the envelope. I can look beyond this and blah, blah, blah. And then I went to my first ever Mind Valley event, which was AFEST. And, and, and I realized that I wasn't alone in a journey of transition, but also the fact that you can actually do good and still make money. 
And I thought for the whole time, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I just need to like, I'm just going to be a nonprofit person. And I'm, I'm going to give everything I have. But no, you can actually do good and make money. Tom Shoes did that. You know, like, you know, Blake McCoskey created Tom Shoes and the one-on-one model. And and so despite the challenges of what that year was at the beginning, the upswing was really well to the point that that was 2013. And even at the end of 2013, which I thought I had a job in the NBA already with two teams, it then happened to me. So I kept on working to myself. So that by 2014, I ended up getting the next job, not because I set my CV and applied for jobs, because they called me while I was giving right. hugs in the middle of Prague. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that story. You know, it's funny, in, in the most challenging of times, when you allow yourself to let go, and that's the, one of the things I've learned so much, when you when you ask for the, ask the universe, God, whoever you believe, a higher power, as an intention for something you really want, and you really want it out of a pure heart, not because of ego, not because to prove your parents wrong, not because of revenge, purely of your heart. And then you ask for that attention and then you just let go and literally dreams come true. And that's happened to me multiple times. Wow. Why were you out in Prague giving free hugs? Because it was, was, my, it just... it was my birthday. Oh. Wow. Yeah, I gave three. I would, before all this YouTube, before all this Instagram, before people doing free hugs on Instagram, I yeah. did it in 2013. Um, I did it for myself and we hugged 300 yeah. people in Prague, Prague, you know, pre-COVID with permission, of course. Um, <laughs> and so, and, 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 and literally, and literally it, it was two days later that I got a call from an NBA team. Wow. Thank you for sharing your story. I can imagine if it would be 300 hugs without the permission. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that was like 300 years. Erwin, <laughs> 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 what, what question would you like us to ask our next guest? Ooh, yes. So I already have one. It's like my question for the next guest. You, the next guest, is this. What's the most embarrassing event you've ever experienced? And what did you do afterwards? Wow, I love that. <laughs> that that's going to be a really fun one. Erwin, I will try to answer it myself as well. Like, <laughs> like basically ask yourself, like, how did you pivot from that embarrassment and what did you do afterwards? It's been an absolute pleasure getting to spend the last hour with you. I want to ask if you can uh, please share with our audience uh, where they can find you, what you have going on, any kind of information that you'd love to share, please. We'd love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'd be honored. Uh, first, you can find me and my journey, my grateful journey this year, which is my year of sabbatical on my Instagram more than anywhere else at Erwin B. Valencia, which is what's written down here at the bottom. Get right there, right there. Uh, Erwin B. Valencia. Uh, and then uh, and then my my website, I'm still re- re- refurbishing it, but then uh, all my other socials are also Erwin B. Valencia, whether it's TikTok, YouTube. This is this is everything. For all my socials, is this guy right there. Uh, but then also my biggest thing is two things. Number one, Gratitude Gang, my nonprofit for mental health for kids in the Philippines, particularly in the tribal uh, mountainous areas, as well as the island of Shargao. Please support that because for us, we're trying to find a way to battle malnutrition and its effect on mental health. And so, the, you know, obviously not just from a funding, but also being able to volunteer back in the Philippines if you feel so called to travel to one of the most beautiful islands in the planet. Uh, that that does still need help and support. Uh, we would love for you to to be part of that. Number one or number two, if you are somebody that is wanting to be in the health, wellness, and performance industry, or are already in it, but need that that guidance, that mentorship to get to the next space, uh, go and check out Grasshopper Project, uh, grasshopperproject.org. It's a it's it's my nonprofit mentorship program that allows for people, whether you're kids or even if you're already a professional that wants to be able to fulfill dreams and get yourself to the next level of where you want to be. Uh, we we have an amazing program that connects mentors and and future uh, thought leaders and change makers in the industry. So grasshopperproject.org and gratitudegang.org. Those are my two. These are my where my heart belongs to those two nonprofits. And so uh, please support them and support me. And if you have any questions, please DM me at my Instagram, which I'm the easiest to find. And I reply to everybody because I'm just that dude. So. <laughs> Erwin, thank you so much and thank you for being in, 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 in trying to really make an impact to your com- community and heritage I really do admire that and respect that so thank you so much for all that you do 
Of course, my 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 thank pleasure you. and my honor. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and uh, uh, I'm excited for your own journey and with Agro Prep and how you can uh, really continue to create the impact you have in this world. Thank you so much. Thank you.